Okay. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me today. I want to tell you a story about two men that raced through the South Pole in the early part of the last century. One of them was first and came back with all of his men. The other one came in second, died in his return, and yet he became the hero. And this is a story that I uh, first intrigued me in uh, 1974 when I was wintering over at McMurdo Sound uh, with, uh, I understand you call him Dr. Ken Jezik. Back then he was just Ken. And uh, I read accounts of both expeditions and something struck me in the reports of Scott's expedition where he was quoted as saying, had it not been for the failure of the younger men, we would have succeeded. And I began wondering, well, who failed them and how? Because at that time, I was one of the younger men in Antarctica, and I didn't want to repeat uh, any of their mistakes. But the more I looked into the story, um, the more questions I had, and the deeper I looked into the printed accounts of Scott's journal, the more questions I had about what was his handwritten journal like. And so in 1988, I obtained a copy of his handwritten journals, a facsimile copy of them, and went and did a word by word, sometimes a letter by letter comparison to translate his handwritten journals into a transcript of, uh, of what he wrote and then compared that to what had been published. And I found differences that were significant. In the next few minutes, what we'll look at is both stories using images and words from the men that were there. We'll also take a look at the press side of this, the public relations part, because I want to highlight some of the media tactics that were used uh, to craft what has become history. Things like message spins, selective editing, alternative facts, fake news, and non-disclosure agreements are not new to our century. They were all in play then. Just a couple of things about Antarctica, uh, of course, uh, and that is, uh, it is known to many of us, it is at the South Pole that the action happens. And if I can get my cursor to work, most of the um, activity will be south of New Zealand, and then down into the Ross Sea, into the Ross uh, Ice Shelf, and then that is the platform from which the attempts at the pole are launched because it's as far south as, uh, as you can sail. Uh, the trick uh, was to get up onto the barrier, go as far south as you could, get up through the mountains, up onto the plateau to the South Pole and back before either nature uh, or, uh, or accident killed you. The story kind of begins in 1840 when Ross sails south, encounters the barrier. He was trying to get to the South Pole by ship and, uh, and basically said, uh, good luck. Uh, you might as well try to sail through the White Cliffs of Dover. This is what the barrier looks like. Uh, it is the size of Spain, roughly about 1,100 feet thick. And uh, Ross really set the pattern for exploration there in the early days by saying, Britain is at the height of empire. We should be exploring the North, we should also be exploring the South, and we should lead other nations in the attempt. And they pretty much had their way uh, for, uh, for much of the globe. You remember the Victorian era, the sun never set on the British Empire, and that's because they really pushed out and explored. But just before the turn of the century, these two guys, Cook and, and uh, Amundsen, wind up in Antarctica on the Belgica expedition, the first expedition to winter in Antarctica. And uh, it was Cook who I think very poignantly wrote about what it was like to spend a winter in Antarctica and that, the dark isolation, uh, the cold and the impact it would have on your souls. As many as you know, uh, the Belgica expedition was plagued by scurvy and Cook reasoned that Eskimos don't get scurvy. Maybe there's a reason and maybe it's because they eat relatively uncooked or raw fresh meat. And so he began killing seals and, uh, and penguins and eating them. And Amundsen was an early adopter. And uh, so he took the cure and, uh, and did quite well. He also learned a lot from Cook. And it was Cook's experiences up in the north uh, with Peary in Greenland and on his own in the, uh, in the Canadian Arctic uh, that really impressed Amundsen. And so he spent a lot of time basically pumping cook for all he knew about how do the Eskimos survive? How do you survive at, uh, at high, high latitude? And, uh, and how can you basically thrive in an environment that kills other people? Well, a few years later, just two years later, this guy, uh, Captain uh, Scott, sailed 2,000 miles south from New Zealand to Ross Island 
set up camp at Hut Point and, uh, and built this hut that you see in the lower right. Of course, the modern station of McMurdo now sits in the background and the ship is the Discovery and many of you are familiar with that story. The um, noteworthy thing here is that Scott Shackleton, who was on the expedition and Dr. Wilson become the first three people to actually walk on the barrier. And they left Ross Island. They got within about 530 miles of the pole. Um, when they were at the half, what normal people, average people would say are the halfway point. That is when you're, you've gone through half of your supplies. Scott decided they would go one week further on half supplies and then turn around and go back. All three men were exhibiting signs of scurvy at this point. It was worse for Shackleton and Scott asked or rather told Shackleton to stay in camp while Scott and Wilson walked another mile further south. So Scott and Wilson claimed the record of further south and Shackleton was cut out of the story. We're still in Scott's journals and also in the newspaper reports that followed when Scott was asked, why didn't you go further south? He referred to the team not being in good health and referred to Shackleton collapsing. Well, this didn't sit well with Shackleton. So in 1907, Shackleton came back uh, to the same place for an expedition, got within 97 miles of the pole. Along the way, discovered the Beardmore Glacier, ascended it for about 130 miles uh, up onto the plateau, and uh, had used ponies to pull sleds across the, uh, the barrier. And the last pony to die on Shacklin's expedition was white. And uh, you'll see how that fits in in just a few minutes. Well, 97 miles away from the pole, they were stuck in a storm. They were short of supplies. And they were beginning to have uh, the incipient symptoms of scurvy. So they turned around and headed back. Scott's reaction to Shackleton using Ross Island as a base to make an attempt on the pole is, is here. It came in a letter that Scott sent to Shackleton. It was basically, get out of my turf. And that attitude you'll see comes up a little bit later when Amundsen winds up at um, the Bay of Wales to make his attempt at the pole. Well, in 1909, about the same time, Cook re-enters the story. And he and Peary have rival claims to the North Pole. Cook comes back first and enjoys the limelight in the press. His navigation records are a little sketchy, but so are Perry's. Perry comes back second, and there's a battle for who actually got there and who didn't and who is uh, lying and who isn't. And Cook is backed by the New York Herald, and Perry is backed by both the New York Times and the National Geographic. Both of their navigation records are questionable, and it winds up in the U.S. Congress to decide, as if they're really a good court uh, in which to make those decisions, which one actually got there and they chose Perry. But three lessons come out of this uh, for the explorers that, that race to the South Pole. First, get back with the news first. Secondly, have really good navigation records. And thirdly, have a good press machine behind you if you can. Well, Scott, in 1909, began raising funds uh, for his attempt at the South Pole. And basically he said, it belongs to an Englishman and only an Englishman should get there and we should get there first. And our main objective is to get there first then we'll study natural phenomena along the way. Amundsen, as you know, or might know, was planning an assault on the North Pole, but now that it's been claimed, he turned around and headed South, even though he had raised funding based on work in the North Pole. He sent a telegram to Scott and Scott was in Australia at the time that said, basically, I'm heading South. Pram was his ship and that's all Scott knew. Well, Scott headed back to Ross Island, and this is the hut that uh, they built on um, uh, at Cape Evans, which is about, oh, say, 16, 18 miles north of Hut Point, because sea ice blocked them from going further south. Three things I'll point out about the hut. The first is, and this is a, a picture taken in the, uh, the mid-1970s when I was down there, uh, of the inside of the hut and some of the uh, supplies still left. And there isn't much storage space inside the hut, particularly when it's arranged for uh, 26 people to have bunks in there. The second thing I'll point out is that uh, they were exercising their ponies. He would uh, adopt what Shackleton found to be useful, at least to a degree, and use ponies. But Scott specified that the ponies had to be white because the last pony that died on Shackleton's expedition was white and Scott figured it must have some kind of an advantage. The third thing I'll point out is this gentleman over on the left. And that's Herbert Ponting, who was assigned to the expedition as their official photographer and his job was to go down in the first year to take pictures and early movies. 
And then he would come back when the resupply ship came down the following summer, go back to England and start giving presentations to make money to help pay some of the debts of the expedition. Here are uh, most of Scott's 31 men. Uh, Scott is in the middle. And uh, for those of you that, uh, that follow polar history, um, I have a, a novel out that looks at both expeditions and, uh, and gives the history in novel form. Uh, Scott in the middle, Atkinson, who takes charge after uh, uh, Scott doesn't come back from the pole, is uh, immediately to his left. And down over the lower right-hand corner uh, is a gentleman called Tom Crean, who also winds up on Shackleton's Endeavor expedition uh, a little later in history. Well, the stage is set for the race. Scott is at Ross Island. He's got a map, check on his map, that leads him to within 97 miles of the pole. And Amundsen has set up camp at uh, Framheim in the Bay of Wales. All of this at the time is unknown and unexplored. Scott doesn't know that yet. So Scott sent Terranova, his ship, east along the edge of the barrier with the idea that they would land six men at the Bay of Wales, build another cabin, and then do exploration on that side of the, uh, uh, of the barrier. Well, when Terra Nova pulled in to Bay of Wales, there was Fram, and that surprised them. So they went ashore and, uh, and uh, met with Amundsen and saw Amundsen's cabin and uh, the tents that housed some of the 110 dogs that uh, Amundsen had at that time. Uh, the hut was adjacent to a uh, part of the sea ice where there was uh, a lot of seals available. There was a, a seal colony there. So the men would have fresh meat and the dogs would have, have fresh meat as well. Amundsen is in the back on the right here, and these are uh, the nine men that were with him uh, in the hut at that time. And the British were impressed. The nine men were experienced. They could ski, they had dogs, they could run them well, they moved quickly and efficiently over the ice, and they seemed to be an industrious bunch. They were always busy doing something. This is a diagram that Scott, excuse me, Amundsen used in uh, his lantern shows or his presentations when he came back to civilization. And the dark uh, sketch that you see here is the footprint of his cabin or his hut. The rest of what you see are sub ice tunnels, workshops, and storage areas so that they could do things under the snow for, throughout the winter. They were well lit, they were kept just below freezing, and they were well ventilated. We compare both, uh, both expeditions and their leaders. Amundsen has Antarctic experience, so does Scott. Amundsen's got more experience in the north and has uh, spent a little good bit of time learning from the Inuit. He's got a crew of nine. Scott's crew is much larger and they have Shackleton's map. Scott will take two good navigators with him to the pole. Amundsen will take four and they'll take independent records. Scott is backed powerfully by the Royal Geographical Society, by the British government. He has corporate sponsors. He's made a broad public appeal. Children in grade schools were donating their pence towards the purchase of a dog or a pony or a tent or a sleeping bag. And he's also backed by the Central News Syndicate, an early news syndicate. And they required non-disclosure agreements to be signed by members of Scott's expedition. In contrast, Amundsen's got his brother Leon in, uh, in Norway. He has a couple of press contracts for articles and he's got limited press support. They also differ in a lot of other ways. The Norwegians learn from the, uh, from the Inuit and they look like they know how to do business in polar climates, head to toe in furs. Scott's group, largely wool, canvas, Burberry. They have uh, a, uh, a fur outer boot and fur mittens, but they don't even have hoods. The Norwegians do not understand why the British won't use dogs or won't use them, at least in the way that the Inuit do and the Norwegians do. Scott will rely on ponies. Specifically, he sent someone to Manchuria to buy white ponies and he got a group of aged, decrepit beasts. Oates is his uh, cavalry officer uh, who's been seconded from the army who will be in charge of the horses, but Oates wasn't allowed to go pick out the horses. Cherry Gerard said all the care in the world, not gonna keep these beasts on their feet. Scott also had motor, uh, motor uh, transport as well. Uh, Lieutenant Evans, who's Scott's second in command, called them wretched failures. One of them gets about 25 miles from Hut Point before it breaks down. The other one got about 30 miles just up onto the barrier before it broke down. Scott will rely on men on skis or on foot pulling the sleds. On the first year, 
The trick is to establish depots out on the barrier that have got your supplies. Amundsen will build three depots. Scott will try to put a depot at 80 degrees. He drops it 30 miles short. Uh, and uh, so that gives Amundsen an advantage in reach. He is depots extend about 150 miles further than Scott's furthest depot. Amundsen's got a quantitative advantage as well. He's got more than three tons of supplies out on the barrier for men, dogs, and, uh, and fuel. Scott has a little less than 110. He names his depot One Ton Depot. And uh, virtually all of that is fodder for the ponies. Problem with ponies is they've got narrow hooves. They sink deeply into the snow. They also eat like horses, so you need tons of forage to keep them going, and they sweat, and so they ice up. Now, in 1903, we, when Scott was looking for his depots on the barrier, when he was coming back, he noted that it's a very small spot on a big ocean. When the snow blows, it's hard to find that single flag. Well, it's a lesson that wasn't missed by Amundsen. And so for safety's sake, instead of marking his depots with one flag, Amundsen put out 20 flags. It's a six mile wide target and each flag is numbered. So if they encounter any of them, they know whether they should move east or west and how far it is to get to the depot. Scott dropped his one ton depot 30 miles short of, the, of his mark, which was 80 degrees south, because he, his ponies were dropping dead on the snow. He would take eight ponies to build the depot. Six of them die, only two come back alive. His cavalry officer, Oates, said, we should be pushing them further. They're going to die anyway. They're not going to make it back to, uh, to Cape Evans. And Scott said, no, uh, because of cruelty, uh, I'm going to drop the depot short. And Oates very prophetically said, I think you're going to regret it. Well, on his way back from dropping depots, Amundsen, Scott got a note concerning Amundsen. And this is a copy of Scott's journal that he wrote up that evening. The men who were there beside him when he read the, read the note said he went on a 90 minute tirade calling Scott, uh, Scott was calling Amundsen every name in the book, calling him a blackguard, uh, a rogue, a cheat, a liar. He was supposed to go to the North and he turned around and he came South. He's, he's made uh, lies to his donors. He's lied to his sovereign. He shouldn't be here. And the, Actions that he's taken are all outside of our code of honor. Something to remember from this passage in his journal is what comes at the end, and that is Scott's decision at this point to proceed exactly as though there were no competitor there. He's going to follow his original plan on dates, how much food it will take, and how he gets to the pole. Oates, the cavalry officer, said, I don't have a problem with Amundsen. He's just been quiet. He hasn't been underhanded. He just hasn't uh, done all the banquets and the hoopla and the press reports about how we're going to be first at the poll. He's kept his mouth shut. Well, the winter sets in and both expeditions have work to do. In Amundsen's sub snow workshops, they work on everything. Their depot trips taught them that they had overprepared based on the earlier accounts of Shackleton and Scott as to how rough it was on the barrier and up onto the plateau. They took wood planes and started to plane down the wooden uh, runners on their sleds and every component of them and the packing crates to save weight. They work on their sledges, their boots, their dog harnesses. They changed the color of the tents and they reduced the total weight of, of non-food and fuel that they're taking by 110 pounds per sled and they replaced it with food and, uh, and also with fuel. Scott retreated to a small office that he had in the hut at Cape Evans and wrote uh, that every detail of our food supplies, clothing and depots was worked out to perfection. This is a phrase, a sentence that will come back a little later in the story. By the way, in the background, these are photos of Kathleen Scott and uh, Scott and Kathleen's young son, Peter. Peter's godfather is J.M. Barry, who was a close friend of, of uh, Scott. And J.M. Barry is the author of Peter Pan. Early in the winter, Scott presented his plan for how they would get to the pole, and he had Cherry Gerard type up meeting notes, and they posted them. And we can see from Cherry Gerard's uh, meeting notes that uh, Scott's plan is based on Shackleton's performance and Shackleton's dates as to when he left and so forth. Two other things I'll point out here. One is, it's quite clear from the notes that were posted and the discussions that they know the barrier gets to be cold in mid-February, and it gets to be really cold in March. And they can also expect to be held up by blizzards in February and March. It comes with the turf. Something else they did in the winter uh, involved these guys, emperor penguins. And Wilson had the idea that by studying the uh, eggs in the early development of emperor penguins, they might be able to find an embryological relationship with 
reptiles. So they set out in the middle of winter on a 70 mile one way, 70 mile back trip from Cape Evans uh, around the south side of Ross Island to Cape Crozier and back, encountered temperatures down to 70 below zero. And Cherry Gerard would write a book uh, entitled The Worst Journey in the World that, uh, that covered these events. Well, Ponting, the photographer, took pictures of them the day they left. And this is Wilson at age 39, uh, just moments before they loaded up the, the sleds and, and headed out, and Cherry Gerard, age 24. This is Wilson soon after he kept it, came back uh, 35 days later, and this is Cherry Gerard. Ponting would write, their looks haunted me for days. We had to carefully excavate them from their clothing. Being scientists, some of them actually weighed the clothing and Cherry Gerard's clothing had accumulated more than 25 pounds of ice. His sleeping bag weighed 27 pounds more and was all accumulated ice inside and on the outside, 27 pounds more than when he left. When summer came, Amundsen was ready for his polar assault and he launched it on the 20th of October. Five men and 52 dogs headed off with heavy loads towards the pole. Scott left four days later in a sequence of events. On the 24th, the motor sledges leave. On November 1st, the ponies left. And on November 5th, the two dog teams. Scott's polar team, 16 men, two motor sledges, 10 ponies, and 14 dogs. The dogs leave last. They're carrying forage for the ponies and Scott has them scheduled to leave last because they move the slowest. He basically follows Shackleton's departure date. Scott's ponies leave on November 1st, Shackleton left on November 3rd. A few weeks after Amundsen left, he'd already found a new way across the barrier, discovered new mountain ranges, named dozens of peaks, ascends the Axel Heiberg Glacier, and he's already at an elevation uh, well up on the plateau and only 180 miles from the pole itself. Scott is barely off the barrier. He's at an elevation of 1,200 feet at the bottom of the Beardmore Glacier, and it's been snowing heavily, and he's been sitting waiting. Three different uh, journals we can consult at this time uh, while Scott's waiting, and they all indicate that he's already overrun his supplies. Even Scott admits in his journal, we've started on our summit rations. That was the rations that they had planned to use once they were up at the top of the plateau, uh, two or three weeks from, uh, from these dates. On the 14th, Amundsen got to the pole. They spent the better part of three days there. They take uh, navigational records. They shoot the sun uh, over a 24 hour period. And then he sends skiers out to box the pole out to a radius of about eight kilometers. He also left a small tent that was surplus to their needs. And inside were uh, fur sleeping bags uh, that they didn't need along with some other equipment and, uh, and clothing they weren't gonna use. He left a letter for the King of Norway talking about uh, their journey and what they had discovered and the men who, uh, who got to the pole in the date, along with a note asking Captain Scott to forward the letter when he got to the pole, because Amundsen was pretty sure Scott was gonna make it to the pole. And uh, then he could deliver this letter as a marker uh, of Amundsen's achievement, just in case Amundsen didn't make it back. On the 14th of December, the same day, Scott's at an elevation of 2,000 feet. He's 400 miles from the pole. The ponies are dead. The dog teams, which he took two weeks further than planned, uh, have turned back. And now three teams of four men are about to ascend the um, Beardmore Glacier. This is a, an illustration from newspapers at the time. The South Pole is up in the upper left-hand corner. And imagine yourself at the lower right, looking up at the Beardmore Glacier. So three teams of four men ascend the Beardmore Glacier. And they, by the 21st, are at this point where Scott will send back Dr. Atkinson with his party of uh, three others, four, party of four, along with dispatches for the newspaper. And they'll build a small depot there uh, of rations that the other two teams can use on their way back. Now we begin to see a series of very strange events, uh, at least I find them strange, in journal entries from Scott's handwritten journals. His second in command, Lieutenant Evans, has been pulling a sled since the motor sledges broke down about 30 miles from Hut Point. So he's kind of tired and members of his team are kind of tired. And they're going along the snows until New Year's Eve when Scott tells Lieutenant Evans and his team, leave your skis behind and proceed on foot while Scott's team continues on skis. 
And then Scott writes, we made fine progress, rapidly gaining on the footholders. He's sending Lieutenant Evans's team out a half an hour, sometimes 40 minutes, sometimes an hour ahead of Scott's own team, and they follow with their skis. On the second, Scott writes, it's a plod for the foot people and pretty easy going for us. He's wearing them out as they wade through the snow. Then on January 3rd, Scott announces to everybody that he's decided to reorganize. The whole trip at this point has been planned in units of four. There's four men to a tent, four men to a sled. The, the food is packed in units of four. The fuel has been allocated in units for four men. And Scott decides to move Lieutenant Bowers from Lieutenant Evans's team onto his own team. And so five will proceed to the pole and Evans will go back with uh, a party of three. Lieutenant Bowers is Scott's logistical uh, wizard and he's also Scott's best navigator. So three men uh, go back, four are on skis heading to the pole and Bowers is without skis. It's an ad hoc decision. And Bowers said, I don't have skis. And Scott said, you're gonna have to make uh, the best uh, as, as you can, follow along, push the sled or, or uh, tie up and uh, we'll go on skis and you go on foot. But Scott's racing to be Shackleton's record. Scott believes the only way up is the Beardmore Glacier. And if he hasn't seen signs of Scott by now, Scott has not seen signs of, of uh, Amundsen by now, then Amundsen is not there. Scott also realizes by the fifth that something he hadn't considered is the allocation of fuel. They couldn't shift fuel uh, into a party of five and a party of three because they didn't have any extra cans of it. So now he's burning a half an hour of fuel that he doesn't have each day. On the 9th of January, he finally surpasses Shackleton's further south by two miles. And he writes in big proud letters, record, beyond the exaggerated walk. Well, Shackleton's walk was anything but exaggerated. And by the way, the word exaggerated is uh, deleted from the published versions of Scott's, uh, Scott's journals. Shackleton's uh, record was anything but exaggerated. He was facing 40 degrees below zero, wind gusts of 80 miles an hour. 97 miles from the pole, they were pinned for 60 hours. And Shackleton would write that they shot their bolt. And I'm going to head back because it's better to be a live donkey than a dead lion. When Amundsen got to the further south record that had been set by Shackleton, he held a ceremony and recognized Shackleton's achievement and then headed on to the pole. A little difference in attitude. A couple of days later, they ran across the first sign that Amundsen had beaten them. It was a single bamboo flagpole painted black with a black flag at the top. The worst had happened. When they got to the pole, utter dejection uh, on all five men, as you might expect. We have had a horrible day. Scott would write, this is an awful place. And then he would write something uh, again, which is deleted from the, uh, the published records of his uh, journals. Now for the run home and a desperate struggle to get the news through first. I wonder if we can do it. What's published is now for the run home and a desperate struggle, period. I wonder if we can do it. The whole intent of that uh, journal entry is changed. He's still hoping to get the news back faster than Amundsen because he knows even though he's a few weeks behind Amundsen, almost a month, if he can get back quickly, the Terra Nova sails quicker than the Fram does. He also believes that Terra Nova's got a shorter uh, trip uh, to get to a place where they can send messages out by telegram. Uh, Terra Nova will go back to Christchurch. He's not sure where the Fram will go, but he doesn't, is not going to be New Zealand. And he doesn't think it's going to be Australia. Well, they found the tent that, Shack, uh, that uh, Amundsen left at the, um, at the pole. And inside, uh, there was extra woolens, uh, excuse me, extra furs and woolens. And um, again, Scott refers to Shackleton's overdrawn account of getting to the pole. Wilson took time and actually made a sketch uh, of, the, uh, of the tent. And inside, they found the uh, note from Amundsen asking Scott to forward a letter. And he was puzzled by the object. A little ways from the Amundsen tent, there was a, uh, an extra ski runner that Amundsen had put on the exact spot of the pole as best they could determine it. There's a flag attached to it along with a note. And Scott told Wilson to ski over to it 
and uh, and bring it back and pull the marker for the South Pole that Amundsen had left out of the snows. And they would tie it to their sled to use as a mast and tie a piece of canvas to it and uh, hope that the wind would help them uh, move them along. Um, and uh, and off they went. Well, they followed their tracks back and that ski runner was kind of clunky on their sled. So Scott said, let's take that off, pull this black painted bamboo pole out of the ground, uh, out of the snow and let's tie it to our sled and use that. And so that is the last of the Norwegians for the present. But there's more to the story and you'll see that the Norwegians come back here in just a few minutes. The wheels begin to fall off uh, the truck, so to speak for Scott very quickly in the next few weeks. They're having trouble finding the depot. They're pulling for food. They're making fewer miles per day than they thought. Petty Officer Evans, not to be confused with the Lieutenant Evans, they're not related, who turned back 150 miles from the pole. Petty Officer Evans has fallen into several crevasses that day, banged his head and dies quietly, probably of concussion. And now a party of four moves on from this point. We haven't talked much about or at all about Scott's rations, and this is uh, this is what his ration were, <coughs> rations were. Excuse me. This is Scott uh, Bowers. Is here. This is uh, Dr. Wilson, and this is uh, Taff Evans, the man who uh, dies of a concussion. Scott's daily ration was about 33 ounces per man per day. Pemmican is a mixture of ground meat and animal fat. The uh, biscuits were specially made to. Scott's formula, and uh, they're basically just uh, carbohydrate, a little butter, a little tea, a little sugar, a little cocoa. Shackleton had suggested you're going to need a diet of at least 40 ounces per man per day. Scott's sledging ration was set at 33. So he was below Shackleton's recommendation, and there's no vitamin C. Signs of scurvy include depression, loss of appetite, all the way down to tachycardia, which is a, a heart uh, that's racing. And the medical journals are pretty clear that 90 days without vitamin C, and you can expect the symptoms of scurvy to appear. And this is indeed what happened to Scott Shackleton and Wilson in 1902. Shackleton's crew again experienced it in 1909. Lieutenant Evans and, uh, and his two men, uh, after they left Scott uh, 150 miles from the pole, experienced scurvy beginning about 90 days uh, and 98 days out. And, uh, and they wind up, two of the men wind up collapsing 36 miles from Moss Island. The third man has to race to uh, Hut Point to, to summon help. And February 1st is day 90, but Scott is 500 miles away from Moss Island. Meanwhile, back at Cape Evans, this is uh, Dr. Atkinson, who was in the first support party to turn back from the top of the Beardmore. He and his three men had the, just the bare beginnings of, uh, of scurvy, and he's concerned uh, for his men. And uh, by the way, Dr. Atkinson, uh, a naval physician whose specialty, and as an author uh, of the novel, I wouldn't make this up. I wouldn't have the, uh, the, the, the gall to make this up, but the Royal Navy decided it was okay. Dr. Atkinson's specialty in medicine is tropical parasitic diseases. And there he is, the physician, uh, one of the physicians in Antarctica. He's never been in command of anything, but now he's in command of the entire British Antarctic expedition. And he has several challenges. The first is Lieutenant Evans and another man named Lashley are 36 miles out on the barrier and they've collapsed from scurvy. So he's got to rescue them. He got Lieutenant Evans back to, uh, to Hut Point, barely alive. He's barely able to keep him alive. Uh, he's at the, uh, Evans is at the edge of death and he put him on the, uh, the Terra Nova, which departed then heading north with Scott's dispatches towards New Zealand. And he still has to restock one ton depot. Scott's plan was that by the time Lieutenant Evans's crew came through uh, one ton depot, there would be no supplies there for Scott's return party. And that one ton depot would be uh, resupplied with enough food and fuel to get Scott's party from one ton uh, one ton depot further north to uh, to the next depot. So <clears throat> Atkinson sent uh, Cherry Gerard out to one ton depot to restock it and said, take as much food and fuel as you can, spend a week and get back. And they barely return. But when Cherry Gerard is at uh, one ton depot waiting until March 10th, Scott is still more than hundred miles away and struggling to get back. We found a shortage of oil is a something that we see in Scott's journals 
as things begin to go downhill. Scott had to do about nine miles per day to make it from depot to depot without running, running out of food and fuel, but he's running short. In 1901, he noted that in their depots, they'd come to a fresh tin of, of oil or fuel, and they'd find that it was only three quarters full or maybe only half full, and that's because they leaked. It was a problem he didn't solve on this journey, and so suggesting, as he does in his journal, that he doesn't know why the fuel is leaking only raises the question of somebody else using the fuel and leaving less behind for him. But the journals of the men who returned make it very clear that they did not even take their fair share. They knew Scott would be short of rations and they left more than their fair share of both food and fuel, yet the cans are leaking. Between March 4th and 6th, Scott is 250 miles from Cape Evans and you can see that things are spinning down. And he admits that they're not able to make the nine miles a day. By the seventh, Oates' feet are frozen. He keeps them out of the sleeping bags because if they thaw, the pain is excruciating. And it's on the seventh that Scott admits he's probably not gonna make it to one ton depot. On the same day, Amundsen's ship is pulled into Hobart, Tasmania, and they have a cable, uh, a telegraph cable that goes all the way back to Norway. And he signaled his brother in Norway that they obtained the pole on those days. So the story is out, but Amundsen will wait three days before releasing his entire story. The 7th of March, three, uh, and these are just three examples, we begin to see fake news in the English speaking press throughout the world. Wellington, New Zealand, Ottawa, Canada, Salt Lake City, Utah, and the story is the same. Amundsen says Scott reached the pole. And this is part of the press strategy that came out of London to do spin control, fake news, and as we'll see later, uh, a little bit of selective editing. Two days after the fake news comes out, the London Times printed um, word of, of Amundsen's achievement. It's on page eight. And there's a companion article that talks about Amundsen may not have played the game fair. He shrouded his intentions to steal a march on, on Captain Scott. And that's a shame for no one would have welcomed cooperation in the work of South Polar exploration more than Captain Scott would. I'm not sure that's quite true. Amundsen's story is boring. If you eliminate the headlines that newspaper editors put in, it's summed up by Amundsen's own words that there was little adventurous about the trip. We'd go 15 miles in six hours, feed the dogs, do some other chores for a couple of hours, go to sleep, and then we'd get up and do it again. So we were doing 20, sometimes 30 miles uh, in a day. On his very best day, uh, I think they did upwards of 30, and his record was 62 miles in a day. And of hardships in the way of food, there were none. Scott, meanwhile, is 78 miles from one ton. Oates is going downhill, and Scott's beginning to write a series of entries that set the stage for future conspiracy theorists, including generosity and thoughtfulness have not been abundant. On March 16th, it's Oates's birthday, and he crawls out of the tent saying, I may not be coming back, and he doesn't. By the end of the month, 11 miles short of one ton depot, Scott is writing his last entries. Nobody else knows that though. Terra Nova returns to New Zealand without Scott on, um, on the 1st of April and a newspaper agent meets the ship and has the dispatches from Scott. So he's really the first person uh, to know when Amundsen got to the pole and where Scott was, and he sends uh, news of that off by cable to London where the story is going to be controlled. Now, Scott, his wife, Kathleen, and this is uh, Clement uh, Markham, who was at the time president of the Royal Geographical Society. We might remember that it was about getting to the pole first and then studying natural phenomena. Well, on, <clears throat> on that same date, uh, April 1st, there's a story that comes out, it's printed in the London Times, the New York uh, Times as well, from Clement Market saying there has been no race. There's no question of racing. The object of this trip and, and Scott's exploration is simply scientific research. Scientific research, no race. A little bit of spin control. 
The press over the next three days uh, is based on the dispatches that Scott had sent back 150 miles from the pole. I'm going to stay an extra year to finish science. I've got thrilling stories, many perils, hairbreadth escapes, et cetera, et cetera, along with uh, rare minerals, strange animals, and other, uh, other things that, were, uh, that we found. Ponting is uh, back as well. He's in England giving uh, presentations to make money. His revenues are about 60%, excuse me, about 60% below expectations uh, because Amundsen's had the news out and uh, participation is a little off in that. But he's got fabulous pictures and he's got motion pictures as well. On the commercial side of the enterprise, there are publicity pictures for Heinz baked beans and uh, uh, Frank Cooper's rhubarb. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know that I'd want to spend a winter in Antarctica in a small wooden hut with 31 people eating Heinz baked beans and canned rhubarb. It just conjures up too many poor images. But it was part of the commercial enterprise that was also part of Scott's expedition. Atkinson, who's in charge of the whole shooting match now, so to speak, is looking at a lot of empty bunks. He's only got 13 people in the whole crew. And he launched a recovery party to backtrack basically the string of depots and try to find the records uh, of, uh, of what happened to Scott and, uh, and Scott's uh, body if possible. And 11 miles short of one ton, they did. The stories of three of the, of the journals that I've looked at uh, are pretty consistent. Silas Wright, who's a Canadian uh, physicist uh, and uh, uh, geologist and geophysicist, got a jack of all trains in that, in that vein, uh, probably saw the object first. And uh, then the others began to, to uh, see it as well. If you, you're on the barrier or off on the sea ice, um, a straight object is not natural. And so the eye is drawn to it. And if we take these three examples, then it's quite clear that what they saw was the bamboo pole that's got it pulled out of the snows, the pole that was left by Amundsen. In the tent, they recovered uh, Scott's journals. They were surprised to find only three bodies and Atkinson read the journals to find out what happened to the other two and indeed uh, the whole story. And he also read Scott's message to the public, which was then uh, uh, brought back and, uh, and printed by the papers. But Scott's message to the public lays it right out there and says the causes are not due to faulty organization, but the misfortune in all risks that had to be run. And he talked about the loss of pony transport, obliging him to start later than intended. Well, we look at his journal entries, we look at his plans, it's not quite true. Same thing about weather that was unexpected and soft snows that couldn't have been anticipated. And those things conspiring to cut into his provisions because every detail of our supplies, clothing, and depots was worked out to perfection. The message goes on to say that he would have returned with a surplus of food, except for the astonishing failure of Petty Officer Evans. Uh, he's the one that died of a concussion. No one could have expected the temperatures they encountered. And he would have got through anyway, except for the sickening of Captain Oates. And these rough notes and our bodies must tell the tale. Well, over the site of Scott's last camp, they built a mound of snow. And Atkinson said, well, we should put a cross at the top and was going to use Scott's skis. And one of the recovery party members was Trigg Gran, who was a Norwegian, a uh, young Norwegian cross-country ski champion who Scott recruited to the team to teach his men how to ski. And Gran said to Atkinson, let me take Captain Scott's skis instead so they may complete his journey. And for a cross, use my skis instead. The last of the Norwegians, Scott's gravesite is marked by a pair of Norwegian skis and his skis complete the round trip on the feet of a Norwegian. Terra Nova had orders to creep into Christchurch, New Zealand in the dark, having had no communications with any other ships. And they arrived at 2 a.m. in the morning and two people stepped ashore. One of them is Dr. Atkinson and he has Scott's journals. They were met by a press agent uh, and the news was then emanated by telegraph from Christchurch the next day. And it was controlled out of London. On that same afternoon, Amundsen was in Madison, Wisconsin, where I am, 
scheduled to speak. And he stepped off the train that afternoon. And the afternoon papers in the in North America carried the story that uh, that Scott uh, died and uh, uh, his records had been found. And Amundsen was accosted by reporters saying, what do you know? What do you, you know? What is this? And it was the first news that he heard. He gave a speech on how he got to the South Pole uh, later that uh, that evening here on campus. The Chicago Tribune estimated the crowd at 3000 and he was um, uh, the first of the, the great explorers to pay tribute to Captain Scott and his polar party. The next day, news accounts, including the message to the public were printed worldwide and the entire English speaking uh, community in the British Empire uh, went into a period of mourning. Story really is summed up in Scott's own words. Had he lived, it would have been a tale to tell of the hardihood, endurance, and courage of his companions. It would have stirred the heart of every Englishman. And these rough notes and our dead bodies must tell the tale. I'll do a timeline here quickly. February 10th, the ship arrived. February 11th, the first worldwide press reports happened. On the 12th, Terra Nova came back with Scott's men. There was a press conference at which they were not allowed to speak because of their non-disclosure agreement. And two days later, on February 14th, there was a memorial service at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. There were 2,000 official mourners inside, including the King of England, Tyre Admiralty, most of Parliament, Lord and Lady, thus and such, Admiral so-and-so, uh, General thus and such, and over 10,000 official mourners outside. It took a lot of political pull to pull that together. London Times would write that that is the temper of men who build empires. And while it lives among us, the empire will stand. In a 1968 preface to the uh, microfilms copy of Scott's handwritten journals that I relied on, his son wrote, it was after all the manner of their death that created the legend. And I think that probably is the truest words. These are some of the sources that uh, I consulted in looking at uh, what really happened in these two expeditions. How do they differ? And how is it that one man became known as the hero and the other one got there first? For those of you that are interested, I do have uh, a book out on this. It uh, was just published. It's available on uh Amazon. It actually is a history book described as a novel uh, because I think things written in novel form tend to have more lasting interest uh, than history, which tends to be written in a dry form. It is probably 90% historical fact and 10% dialogue that I made up based on the journals that I've read. I think that's all I wanted to share. I'm going to try to hit the stop share button if I can find it. There we go. And uh, we should be back live. Thank you for listening. All right. Thank you very much, Dennis. So at this point, we'll open it up to questions. Uh, if you are online, you can use the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. And if you're in person with me, just raise your hand and we'll call it out. So while everyone's writing, I guess I'll ask, what was the most interesting part of your findings as you were diving into this research? Um, probably the press end of it. That I didn't expect to be as, as tied together and orchestrated as it was. I began to see little bits and pieces in some of the journals about a contract agreement with the press and a little notation about a press agent in, um, in New Zealand. And so as I wrote the novel to try to pull these things together, I, I invented the press agent in New Zealand because I was seeing too many things that were coordinated. It could not have happened without a press agent and without spin control going on. Um, after 33 years working in uh, state government, I had some knowledge of what those kinds of things are. So in the novel, I invented a character. It wasn't until about eight years after I'd written that, uh, those segments that I actually found the name uh, in the archive of a Christchurch New Zealand uh, newspaper, uh, the name of the agent who was acting in that role. The other thing I think that surprised me was Scott's reluctance or inability to, to learn from past mistakes and seek information from people that knew stuff and had experienced things. He makes the same mistakes in the Terra Nova expedition that he encountered in the Discovery expedition. The fuel cans, for one, 
not wearing hoods and furs for another, not using dogs, this manly belief in we're better pulling the sleds ourselves than relying on dogs to, uh, to transport. Uh, at the same time, they did innovative things uh, in terms of bringing scientists down to uncover secrets and set the stage for much research that was then to follow, the use of motorized transport and attempting to, uh, uh, to utilize that. So other questions? I have one here. I always thought the pony thing was so weird. Why on earth would he think that the ponies were the way to go? I don't get it. So, so this is from, from Laura. So Laura says she thinks the ponies were really bizarre. Why on earth would Scott think that ponies are the way to go? Well, if you remember uh, back to the presentation, he bases his run on the poll on Shackleton's results. And I don't know how Shackleton got the idea to use ponies, but uh, but he did. And they were successful to a limited extent. They were able to pull sleds a long way over the barrier before they uh, they collapsed. But then Scott goes through this, this, I'm going to emulate Shackleton and beat his record kind of ego thing. And I see it written in... Uh, the, uh, the discovery report and uh, in things that Scott wrote after uh, uh, the Nimrod expedition, Shackleton's 97 miles to the pole. And then he sort of emulates the same, uh, the same idea instead of going with dogs. When um, Scott was first introduced to polar exploration, it was by Clement uh, Markham, who was his mentor. And uh, Scott was sent to a, a geophysical meeting, a geographical meeting, excuse me, um, in Northern Europe where there were a lot of polar explorers, including Nansen, uh, who had done, uh, Norwegian done a lot of exploration in Greenland and, uh, and then also up in the Arctic. And Scott had never been at a high latitude and stood up at the meeting and said, I, I don't, uh, I think the use of dogs is cruel. And uh, I think man hauling is the way to go. And Nansen stood up and said, I've been all over the North. I've pulled sleds by by myself by, with men. And I pulled it with dogs. To use dogs is cruel. To use men is crueler. And just what Scott had in mind. So, in, and it's it's kind of strange. Um, when Oates first saw the decrepit beasts that they had, he was in New Zealand, and, and the beasts were in uh, the, the ponies were in quarantine. He sent off to a former um, uh, officer of it, a superior, saying, "Send me mules." From the Himalayas. And so when Terra Nova came back to resupply uh, Cape Evans, they had uh, six mules uh, that they then used for the uh, recovery mission the next year. And they didn't work out any better than the horses did. Um, the uh, Manchurian ponies ate snow, the mules didn't. So the mules didn't have anything to drink. Other questions? Thank you for your answer. So I have a question here about Scott's rations. So you mentioned Scott's rations. What do you know about Admonson's and how were they different? How much difference do you think the type of rations made or is it quantity over quality? Uh, a little of both. Scott's rations had about um, some of the notes that I have here, uh, about 500 calories per day more per man. Uh, it should be Amundsen's rations did. Amundsen's rations had a lot more natural foods in them. His biscuits were made by a different formula, contained a lot more whole wheat and, uh, and bran and other things. He was carrying uh, dried fruits, which are a source of vitamin C. They had prepositioned in his three main depots um, almost a ton and a half or more of seal meat, not only for the dogs, but also for themselves. So they're eating a lot of good stuff all the way along the line. Scott's diet doesn't have those things. Uh, Scott relied on a lot of donated products, and uh, there's a company still in business in uh, in England uh, making uh, uh, pre-processed uh, cookies and things uh, that made the biscuits for him. And looking at their formula, it doesn't have a lot in it but carbohydrate, and that was it. Scott's rations were divided up per man. They were divided up into absolutely equal portions, regardless of how much work you did as an individual or how, how, how big or how small you were. Amundsen let his, eat, his men eat their fill. And somebody that had skied uh, three miles one way and three miles the other way, putting out flags from a depot would get a larger meal just to be satisfied than the others. 
he also had roughly twice as many uh, supplies as he needed for the trip. And that was, uh, that was the way he planned it. In one of those slides that I usually might have seen it, Scott leaves for the poll uh, from his last depot on the plateau with uh, a little more than two weeks of rations for his five men. Amundsen leaves with 30 days of rations on his sleds. He just had that much in surplus. Other questions? Thank you. Other questions? I'll ask one more question, and then okay. I think that's, and if anyone has any lingering questions, then they can ask that now. Um, my last question is, how can we take some of the, you, you know, you alluded to kind of how food is, rations are distributed. What are some other kind of takeaway and good lessons and best practices for anybody who is interested in traversing any part of the polar regions, spending a long period of time there and so on? What are some of the best kind of survival of skills and, and whatnot? I would I would say two things. One is read everything you can from historical accounts so you can avoid the mistakes that they made. Start out small first and uh, and and get experience um, before planning anything major. Uh, a big difference between uh, obviously then and now, or uh, when, for example, Ken Jezik uh, in ancient times first went to uh, to Antarctica, is the use of satellite phones in case you get in trouble. Take enough backup to, uh, to be able to not only know your limits, but also if something unexpected happens, uh, to get uh, to get out of trouble if you can. And and also be very young. Once you get to be my age, you don't do stuff like that uh, because you know better. <laughs> Okay, thank you. That's a, that's a good answer. Um, I have Lonnie Thompson sitting in this room. He laughed when he said to be young. Um, someone it, asked here. It does you... help. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Someone asked here, can you tell us a little bit about your experience in Antarctica? And thank you for a great story. And then also, um, if you could, if you have a, a contact information that you could share, whether that's in the chat box or if you could forward that to me to pass along to our attendees, that would be great as well. So the question about your experience in Antarctica. Okay, let me put in my uh, email link there first. And hopefully it'll make it go up there. Okay, that looks right. Uh, my experience in Antarctica, well, I was, I was just 21. I turned 22 while I was there. And a major prof came to me after a lecture uh, at DePaul University and said, I want to talk to you after class. And I was like, oh, what did I screw up? And then uh, I was asked uh, to be a field assistant doing biological research uh, at McMurdo, primarily charged with going out on the sea ice throughout uh, the time that we're, we were there, including the winter, collecting marine specimens, bringing them back alive. We were studying krill, among other things, to the laboratory where we were looking at their physiology, trying to figure out how do these things metabolize at temperatures of minus two degrees Celsius when the, uh, the biochemistry uh, says uh, their enzyme systems shouldn't be working fast enough to, uh, to make them live? Um, so that was, uh, that was the purpose of it. And uh, it was the experience course of a lifetime, as you might imagine, uh, being there, being a young explorer, doing interesting biology. Um, the fact that we could get a ham radio patch back to the United States about once a week or maybe every 10, 14 days to say hi uh, to family, but otherwise uh, you know, not basically even following the news back in the United States because what was important was what we developed as a society uh, locked in in isolation and uh, what we did to, uh, to connect to each other. Uh, we often said... Uh, if you could take all the world leaders and lock them up in Antarctica for the winter and cut them off from communications, they could probably solve a lot of problems and, uh, and, and wouldn't bicker about certain things. And the nightmares went away after about eight years, I think. Good on questions here. Alrighty, Dennis, th thank you, thank you, thank you so much. That was really fascinating. I really enjoyed listening to that. 
Um, for those of you who are online, I do have this recorded, so you can watch it after the fact. I think we plan to post it in our history corner, um, so keep an eye out for a follow-up email um, as we get that posted. One last thing, I have to put a plug in for the book because that's what authors do. The name of the book is Heroes All, Race to the Pole. And again, it's about 90 or 95 percent actual history. I wanted to write it as a novel because it's better at engaging people that wouldn't otherwise consider uh, these kinds of, uh, of historical events or interesting places like Antarctica. The feedback I've gotten from readers is, frankly, um, uh, overwhelmingly positive uh, rather than being humiliated. That, that's the negative side of being an author sometimes. Uh, the most frequent comment I get is, I got really cold while reading it. Uh, and so uh, if you find it, it's and <clears throat> excuse me, it's in Amazon, uh, both as a uh, as a paperback and also as an ebook. Uh, I would be delighted and, and very uh, happy if you would consult a copy and, and uh, think about purchasing it. Besides, there's a lot of things in there you can look up and check as facts. Longitudes, latitudes, temperatures that uh, are in the novel that were taken from Scott's handwritten novels, excuse me, handwritten journals. And they differ, by the way, from the published editions uh, in that many of the temperatures that he wrote as plus, they published as minus. You can go find them in the, in the, uh, in the novel. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Dennis. And to everybody else online, have a great day. And thank you again for joining us. Dennis, we'll see you later.